We're just waiting for attendees to flow in and uh, start the webinar. So a very warm welcome to all the participants in our session today. Welcome to our eminent speakers and thank you for taking out time for this panel discussion today. So in our session, we have invited the guest members from one of the renowned plastic industry association and plastic manufacturing industry. They can give us an insight on the employment opportunities and career pathway in the plastic manufacturing industries and the career opportunities for the youth to get skilled and employed under the apprenticeship promotion scheme in the manufacturing units. And the eminent speakers from the NSTC is also being invited to provide us an insight on the NAP scheme. So welcome all the guest speakers in the session. Thank you. Okay. So uh, to begin the session, let me first uh, give you a little introduction about our Sector Skill Council. So Rubber Chemical and Petrochemical Skill Development Council is a Sector Skill Council for rubber, chemical and plastic industries. It was constituted in year 2012 under the ages of National Skill Development Council under the guidelines of Ministry of Skill Development and Entrepreneurship to fulfill the demand of skilled workforce in the industries. <clears throat> RCP STC represents a milestone and long journey of supporting skilling program in the country. Almost 2.5 lakh students have been enrolled for training by more than 100 affiliated training partners of RCP STC. After serving the rubber sector for nine years, RCP STC has given an additional responsibility by merging the CPC sector with us. So we are gearing up in right earnest to serve the nation through skill training in the CPC vertical as well. RCP STC has set about creating a robust infrastructure for the plastic domain, as well as in the structured and calibrated manner. IPMA, that is All India Plastic Manufacturing Association has provided full support to the Sector Skill Council for the creation of national occupational standards in the plastic sector. So they have also initiated the skill-based trainings to be conducted in collaboration with Haryana Skill Development Mission recently. ICMA is always being supportive to RCP STC and we are blissful to have such a supportive association with us. There are new expectations and new aspirations on the horizon from RCP STC as its jurisdiction is being extended to include the chemical and plastic sector as well. So we uh, urge the plastic industries to come forward to the schemes and programs like Skill India, Pradhan Mantri Kaushal Vikas Yojana, recognition of prior learning, national apprenticeship promotion schemes, and many others, under which trainings can be conducted in different states to meet the need of the plastic sector. So industries may connect with us by writing us at info at rcpsdc.in. So I'm just writing this email ID in the chat box as well. So for any skill-based training and certification requirements, industry can connect with us at this email ID and our toll-free number. So let me welcome to all the guest members for the panel discussion on the topic, industry benefits under the National Apprenticeship Promotion Scheme. Here we have with us, Mr. Hiten Bheda. He's a chairman, IPMA, Environment Committee, Mr. Babu Bhaskaran, he is VP HR in EPL Limited, and Mr. Yen Eben, he's a consultant apprenticeship from NSDC. Thank you all, sir, for joining the session today. Thank you. I'm just writing the email. Thank you. <laughs> wherein we can be contacted by industries. And the toll free number also. So from here, let me invite our panel speaker, Mr. Hiten Bheda. 
He's a chemical engineer by training, has been associated with plastics since the beginning of his career. He pursued a BS degree in chemical engineering from the University of Tennessee, Department of Chemical and Polymer Engineering, Knoxville, USA. He's continued his education at the University of Connecticut, uh, Connecticut to obtain a master's degree in chemical engineering. After returning to India, he was engaged in conversion of engineering plastics and how, have worked on uh, casting of uh, polyamides, polyurethanes, as well as extrusion of engineering polymers and high performance polymers. He has closely worked with many OEMs and government institutions for successful application of these products involving extensive design and testing of material for qualification. He has served the trades in the capacity of Honorable Editor of Plastic News, Vice President, past President of IPMA, and currently he is a Chairman Environment Committee. He has represented government advocacy on fiscal and other policy matters as well. He is active member of SPE and IP, member of Tavita Pai, an honorary engineering fraternity based in the USA. He spends his free time to support social cause through family trust, providing medical help and vocational training in the suburbs of Mumbai. And he's also associated with Education Trust, BNKCT, as a managing trustee. My heartiest welcome to Mr. Hitain for joining the session today. Thank you very much, Dipala. So, uh, for a nice uh, introduction. You're welcome, sir. Uh, so my first question that goes to uh, sir, with your rich experience along with the manufacturing industries and association, kindly suggest the industry perspective on the pattern of hiring the fresh candidates nowadays and the expectation of industries in terms of the qualification and the skill requirements. Uh, yeah, so, uh, you know, uh, with the plastic industry for over two decades now, I can see very clearly a change in trend. And particularly in last two years, you know, uh, because of the pandemic, a lot of uh, things have gone completely upside down. Uh, the, the industry has been affected uh, during the pandemic. Uh, to operate without human resources. And because, you know, the plastic has been a savior uh, during the pandemic, uh, you know, we necessitated uh, several products to be manufactured uh, at very short notice. So there was a complete mismatch of, uh, you know, what was required and what was available. And uh, as a result, what happened, there was a thrust in uh, with, uh, you know, whatever labor was available, they were trained on job to perform specific tasks without really uh, getting into details. But they were fully focused because they were, there was no distractions available for them. So, you know, that, that uh, industry did a productivity out of this. Also, there was a lot of psychological pressure on the workforce. So, you know, uh, we found uh, a new trends in, in the productivity. Uh, it also goes without saying that a lot of uh, enterprises were working uh, under strained financial, uh, you know, environment. Uh, so that also, uh, you know, they had to uh, fire a few people who were not, uh, you know, up to the mark or not relevant. So it, it, all this, uh, and not to mention the hike in cost structure, necessitating, uh, you know, necessary productivity, and to avoid leakages in terms of waste. So all this culminated in a requirement that is more, uh, you know, uh, towards uh, uh, probably well-trained, uh, well-skilled human resources. So, uh, Currently, the industry looks for, you know, people who are uh, uh, having uh, some formal qualification as well as hands-on training. So, and, and there is a still a huge gap between the 
demand and the supply. So we see a very um, good opportunity uh, to uh, you know have this kind of a scaling programs in place. So uh, also uh, we must appreciate that uh, you know there is a new normal for the industry with Make in India, <clears throat> Atmanabar India. And um, now we are treated, uh, you know, uh, against the global manufacturers. So uh, with all these things, uh, you know, we, we think that the training uh, is becoming more and more relevant uh, as of now. Also, you must see that uh, the, the technology change has been there in uh, terms of the equipment, uh, you know, are they outed by larger automation or they are controlled by uh, more uh, uh, CNC kind of for devices or uh, you know uh, uh, IT devices so all that uh, you know requires a new kind of skills all along with the older skills so again on-job training has become much more relevant so this is uh, you know our take uh, on on the or uh, our perspective on the pattern of hiring and the expectation of the industry. Yes, Deepmala? Yes, sir. Hello? Can you hear me, sir? Yeah. So, uh, you know, yeah, I can hear you. So, uh, you know, this added with, uh, you know, uh, the opportunity window, uh, that is getting uh, you know very clear. Uh, if you remember uh, very recently, our honourable finance uh, commerce minister, uh, Sri Piyush Ji, uh, said that the plastic industry needs to go from five lakh crores of today's size to ten lakh crores in next three to five years. Now that kind of growth calls for uh, you know large amount of human resources and uh, with the relevant training. Also, uh, because of uh, this uh, pandemic, you know, India is now also getting an opportunity to export its products. Uh, you know, because uh, the globe is looking for China plus one kind of, uh, you know, sourcing destination. And that's where uh, we have seen in last uh, six, seven months, there is a, a sort of a surge in the exports from India on plastic products. So uh, th these all, uh, you know, will uh, kind of, uh, uh, you know, boost the need for skilled human resources. Right, sir. That's really great. And so what, uh, what is your suggestion for the industrial training upon hiring the fresh candidates? What kind of training being provided to them and uh, once the pressure uh, is being hired in the manufacturing industries, what sort of initial trainings? So traditionally, you know, uh, when a fresher is hired, uh, you know, uh, either from a directly school or college, you know, he is put as an assistant to a senior person and uh, he is left alone to learn on his own. Uh, sometimes the seniors do a good job of uh, training uh, uh, younger people. But a lot of times what happens is, uh, you know, uh, the trainee himself has to take a lot of initiative to learn everything. And uh, that training is not supported by, uh, you know, the theoretical aspect. It's just the hands-on practical aspects. So we, we see there is a clear gap, uh, you know, uh, so uh, sometimes, uh, you know, this kind of training uh, makes uh, the worker quite efficient in performing a specific task uh, without really having a formal background uh, to understand the process. So if there is any, uh, you know, variable that is changed, then he becomes lost. You know, he, he is not able to perform that efficiently. Or he has to again uh, go through that rigmarole of uh, upgrading himself to do a specific uh, additional job. 
so we feel that uh, some sort of uh, uh, formal training along with the practical uh, training will go a long way uh, in creating the right kind of workforce uh, who who can uh, really perform we must appreciate dipmala that uh, traditionally you know our industrial model uh, has been leveraging the labor cost and uh, you know that's where uh, you know uh, it was uh, when necessary to have somebody performing a repeated task uh, very efficiently but i i think uh, those days are over now uh, we we have to uh, you know uh, graduate uh, to a new concept and new uh, models if we want to be competitive globally so in in this uh, we know um, uh, i i think a, a model which combines the uh, theoretical aspect uh, as well as the practical aspect uh, will be very helpful and uh, also uh, you know we, what we have seen is that uh, different uh, geography regions have different uh, uh, skill levels in the sense there is you know they they are more adept at certain skills and they are uh, you know like everybody you cannot train in the same way so that a difference has to be taken into account and also the language barrier so uh, since now there is an initiative to provide this kind of training in all regional languages that will also help a lot yes um, i'm sure we have people from varied background and from various regions this can surely be helpful for them those who are you know they have never gone out of their uh, own state and they have never experienced speaking to people from outside yeah so what is your opinion about sir uh, national apprenticeship yes sir yeah so one one more thing uh, you know we we are seeing a very clear trends in the plastic industry uh, that uh, you know uh, our plastic industry was concentrated more in west and south and during the last two years we have seen a lot of uh, a lot of uh, workers were coming from up bihar odisha uh, you know uh, now we we have seen a trend where they are migrating back to their uh, you know uh, their own region and hence there is a vacuum and uh, uh, for example you know uh, like a specific uh, activity would have a concentration of a, spe- a specific people migrating from x state now all that has gone for a, a completely uh, uh, you know toxic to away and uh, a, a completely new regime is taking place so this is what uh, you know uh, also the growth rates uh, are going to be much higher uh, in south and in north uh, you know so there there is going to be some sort of a migration from uh, for the other regions to this regions so where do we train also will make a difference because they will have to train themselves and relocate where the jobs are available so that uh, mismatch also has to be uh, addressed uh, as far as this uh, national apprentice scheme is concerned i think it's an excellent scheme uh, uh, it's tailored for uh, skilling for specific requirement uh as you know the specific modules are being prepared now uh and combined with relevant uh, application opportunity uh it has language flexibility uh, and for the industry it has a great cost advantage because of subsidization and exemptions from certain mandatory deductions like the uh, yes tax also the industry gets an opportunity to select and groom needed talent uh you know to suit their medium to long term plans so you know they they can uh uh the right apprenticeship and induct them they also is there and i think now this is you know we did the from 
he uh, is uh, being uh, in the from one unit to another unit you know uh, there will be some sort of a judgment yardstick for the industry to measure that okay this for currently uh, uh, suitable to this or not Sir, I think you're breaking here. Sorry. Hello. Yes, sir. So Am you're I audible? Breaking the last line, we couldn't hear. Hello. So I think there is a network problem. Uh, we've lost his voice. Sorry. Uh, yes. Yes. Yeah. So uh, what I was saying is uh, in German, uh, you know, the, uh, the plastic industry is very robust. Um, so I, I think uh, uh, our plastic industry can really benefit from uh, uh, this kind of opportunity. Um, so in, in foreign countries, I've seen people starting at uh, apprentice uh, level and then reaching up to management level, uh, you know, just learning the tricks of the trade uh, through training and experience, both combined. So Way. Yes, Deepmala. Right, sir. Hello. Right, sir. So we have certain uh, raised hands. So uh, just to uh, tell the audience, uh, the participants can write their questions in the chat box and we'll surely take it ahead with these speakers. So one of the um, uh, participant has already asked one question. If you can address this, Mr. Hitain, um, has the plastic industry embraced RPL, recognition of prior learning? Please share your experience. Can you, can you repeat that? Yes, yes sir, please. Uh, plastic industry uh, has experienced the RPL program, that is Recognition of Prior Learning program, that is uh, the uh, training and certification of the candidates within the shop floor of the industry. So if you have experienced any such industry, maybe you can share your experience. Uh, so, yeah, the mafia has successfully used this kind of model. I think uh, many of us, I think uh, the uh, profile extrusion for the window profiles, there is a program uh, in conjunction with uh, some uh, German uh, association. So that has uh, been working in uh, uh, Rajasthan somewhere. Uh, and that has successfully, uh, you know, created human resources for the industry. Okay, great, sir. So others also, if you have any questions, kindly write it in the chat box so then we can uh, raise those questions from the speakers. All right, so uh, moving ahead, our next speaker is from the industry. Uh, which is a plastic industry and in fact it's a pla packaging industry epl limited it's incorporated in year uh, 1982 it's a global specialty packaging company they have their offices across the world they deliver extraordinary packaging solutions that cater to the world's top fmcg and pharma companies uh, the company manufactures the products such as laminated tubes plastic tubes caps closures etc so we have here with us, Mr. Uh, Babu Bhaskaran. He's a VP HR in EPL Limited. Uh, sir is a senior HR professional. He's currently associated with EPL Limited as a VP HR for uh, Africa, Middle East, and South Asian region. He's worked with the companies like Godrej, Unilever, RPG Group, and he is a of Data Institute of Social Sciences. 
So um, EPA Limited is also, sir, associated with us as in a rubber chemical and petrochemical skill development council from the last one year now. They have been hiring uh, nearly 50 candidates being hired for the job role, machine operator, plastic processing, and printing and patching, packaging operator of RCPSTC. Uh, welcome to Thank the- Thank you for that kind introduction. So uh, welcome to the session and thanks uh, for taking out time from your busy schedule. And uh, my question for you, sir, kindly share your experience regarding the hiring of freshers under the apprenticeship scheme and uh, what's your feedback for the apprentices who are working with EPL under the NAPS program? Wonderful. First of all, thank you for the opportunity to uh, present, uh, to be present here and share uh, our experience as EPL. EPL is a global company. We have 21 manufacturing locations across 12 countries. We are one of the largest manufacturing across the world. Uh, and um, every and every, uh, any and every pharma, pharmaceutical company, FMCG company would be our customer. And hence, the level of automation, the level of skills, the kind of quality of our product has to be global scale. Additionally, being a global player, we always associate the rest of the industry up and down the value chain. So our customers are global, our suppliers are global, hence our thinking and our systems and processes are also adopted to that. We are proud to say that we are one of the very few Indian multinational companies who are truly uh, multinational with the appropriate systems and processes. That said, uh, we started on the journey of um, increasing the intake of apprentices about uh, two years ago. Um, initially, we were at the minimum mandatory of 2.5% of our workforce, and uh, we, uh, we really uh, were not that focused. Uh, however, in the last two years, we have realized that we need to partner with the NSDC, the rubber um, council, and our experience has been uh, very good in terms of uh, the kind of talent we are able to work. Before uh, going into the apprentice, apprenticeship scheme, I'm sorry, uh, we heavily recruited under the National Employability Enhancement Commission team. And uh, there about 30% to 25 to 30% of the population we were able to intake. Okay? However, one of the concerns was always that these are not qualified people, they did not have uh, the requisite experience and um, essentially, uh, the, the kind of talent that we are today able to get through a leadership scheme was not available. Uh, so, a couple of years back, we started the journey of increasing the percentage from 2.5% to 15%. We are today about 11 to 11.5% of our workforce's uh, apprentices. To be precise, we have about 250, uh, 240 to 250 apprentices live as of today. Now, our experience has been that we need to create an appropriate environment for uh, the, these apprentices to come in and flourish. Okay? At the same time, 15% uh, is a huge volume, right? So uh, you need to create opportunities for them not only to learn, but also uh, make them employable in a way where they're not only part of your good as a part of your system, but uh, they're good. Uh, employees and good contributing members of the society going forward as well. So uh, we have a dedicated uh, training manager. We have each of our eight plans and dedicated trainer for these apprentices. And we have created an ecosystem around which they not only do their jobs uh, and get trained, but also become equally capable of running our one of some of the most sophisticated machines in the laminated tubes business. So our experience has been extremely good. Uh, today, we have been able to onboard about 10% of, of the apprentices. And our effort is to see how we can move away from our transactional employment, which comes in the form of contract labor, to more transformational employment, which comes in the form of apprentices. So we are in on a journey of converting most of our um, roles into permanent roles and apprenticeship is one of the key ways we are approaching 
solve that problem. That's really great. So that's really good to see the performance is also increasing and finally they're getting an opportunity to work in the company as permanent. Uh, really great. So our effort is to see how, uh, how we can intake each and every one of them. As Mr. Hiten also mentioned, it's an opportunity for us to observe their performance, their orientation, their interest, and based on all of this, make a decision whether this is the right organization for them or they need to go and look elsewhere. Uh, so that's the submission, Deepmala. Great, sir. So that's giving positive vibes about the apprentices. And um, uh, so what is the structure of the training program which is being conducted for the apprentices in the EPL upon so hand? The, the, the way the way that we intake is we have two batches joining us every month and we at least uh, look forward to a batch of 15 to 20 to start a batch. Uh, the initial 15 days is completely about what is an industry? What is it? What is a factory? Right? How do you work? What is the structure? To uh, introducing them to the basics of how the machinery works. What is the industry about? What is plastics about? Um, and these 15 days, are taken to completely orient them towards not only working, but working in EPL and in terms of what kind of uh, inputs they're going to be given. Going forward, every month, there is a syllabus which is decided for them, which is divided into 12 parts. That means 12 months, 12 interventions would be there. And our assumption is that once we assess at the end of 12 months, we will have complete view of whether the person has internalized the concepts, displayed them on the job, and has interest in continuing it as a part of his career. And hence, we are able to take a holistic view. So the idea is that the initial part, 15 days, we, we onboard them, we look at them, we, we give them a view of where they are coming. Throughout the next one year of apprenticeship, every month, structured interventions in terms of either they're going into high speed lines or low speed lines or the printing lines or the uh, other lines that we may have and assessment at the end of the uh, year. That's how we assume. I hope that answers Hello. it. Please. Yes, sir. So you are having uh, continuously assessments and you know continuous training throughout the training period instead of just working on the shop floor maybe. That's a gradual learning for them of course. They also get a breather in between. They're working also and then getting trained also. Yeah, we have a structured training program where uh, we have dedicated about eight hours of training uh, uh, in, in 15 days to 20 days. And uh, it really covers, so we have seen that whoever is going through this 12, 12, 12 month period becomes a productive uh, employee and is able to run the machines. And we have some of the world-class machines and the latest machines. In fact, some of the manufacturers like PSG, they design machines for us. Okay. So they're able to run those machines. So uh, I believe our training is quite effective. Yeah, I'm sure this kind of cha giving challenges to the university programs as well, <laughs> because the kind of learning they are having kind of working as well as experiential learning is something different that they any which ways cannot get it in any kind of a university. So uh, what is your opinion regarding the uh, iteration rate of the candidates? Because usually in the manufacturing industries, we have noticed that people do uh, kind of, you know, move. It definitely is a challenge. Deepala, and uh, there are no easy ways of working around it. Okay? In, a, uh, in a country where, where you have more than 50% unemployment in youth, you have a problem of attrition where your attrition is 50%. So... It, it, is, it is quite a conundrum to solve. What has really worked for us is holistic job reviews, letting people know where they are entering, what they're going to do. In fact, we have created small videos of their work and how their work day is going to look like, how their training period is going to look like. And then the attrition rate comes on. We have initiated a process where we are not differentiating between our permanent employees and the apprentices to an extent that the uniform is same, the other facilities are same. So they feel a part of the organization right from the day they come in. So the day they come in, they are handed a uniform, which is what our other employees wear. And that gives them a sense of belonging. These are a few measures that we have put in place to curb attrition. At the same time, I should really mention, 
um, in the past two years, we have recruited about 600 apprentices. And today I have 250. It's a huge issue. And while there are benefits to it, um, there is always a, definitely a pushback from the line managers and the shop floor that what's the point of training them if their engineers going to go away? And uh, so it, it's more an internal matter, but as you're saying, uh, attrition is an issue and it needs to be solved at a couple of levels if you, uh, if you ask me. One has to be at the level of the company where the company has to create itself as an employer of choice and pe for people to pay back. And second, some intervention can be done contractually or by the uh, sector skill council or the NSDC where there's some amount of lock-in period. I mean, um, everybody has a choice where they should work, but there is an investment that an organization makes while you're training the apprentice and somewhere, um, People like us who are trying to promote the apprenticeship scheme face a lot of backlash um, and, um, you know, some sort of help from NSP and sector council. But uh, however, uh, 450 out of 600 is still a good number. It's, it's 250 out of 600. Okay. Okay. <laughs> so it's more than 100% yes. that I'm facing today. Yes. Yes. I trust you completely the kind of investment it would be for the industries because at the end of the day, what industry demand is just to have uh, the uh, strengthening of the manpower and uh, those manpower can work within the industry at least for some good two to three years so that they can get the productivity out of it when they have hired and they have invested so much into the, yes, apprentices. Right. Thank you, sir, for your valuable guidance. And uh, I'm sure uh, that your years of experience in HR and acceptability towards the scheme and apprentices, it's giving a positive energy to the other industries also who's joined us in the session. Yes. Uh, this uh, iteration rate, of course, gradually will also be lower down because, uh, you know, these trainees also see each other. They also see people growing, people getting permanent, as in when they're getting their tenure apprenticeship completed, they're going to gain knowledge and certification, of course, would be given to them. Was that if they are getting a chance upon performance, of course, but if they are getting a chance to get permanent basis, their performance, then it would be a role model for others also. And in fact, I'll tell you the statistics with me is that whoever is completing apprenticeship, I'm giving permanent. Right. Fortunately, not many are sticking through to complete the apprenticeship and they are moving away before. Uh, that, however, that shows a good sign, yes. Yeah. Because I'm sure word of mouth really matters. And once that goes into a habit that if I complete, I get a chance, I'll be grabbed, I'll get permanent, then that becomes a habit for them to get completed and get synced to it. All right. Thank you, sir. And uh, let me invite uh, the uh, uh, speaker, uh, next speaker from NSTC, Mr. Yen Eben. Uh, he's a consultant apprenticeship. He's joined NSTC in 2019 as a consultant on industry engagement. He previously worked for German International Corporation and German Chamber of Commerce in Western Balkan countries to set up apprenticeship scheme with employers and also advises chambers on the organizational development. And his main area of interest are the promotion of apprenticeship, the law of skilling and vocational education and uh, the internationalization of VET. So uh, my warm welcome, Mr. Yen, for the session today. And thanks for having me, Deep Mala, and uh, greetings to all the 40 plus participants that we yes. have in this uh, presentation. Excellent. Um, special thanks because you have just now recovered from uh, the pandemic, this coronavirus, which is going uh, on. <laughs> I feel good now. My voice is still a thoughts. little hoarse. You may hear that because I had such a bad yes. death cold and so forth. But uh, life goes on. And the, this Omicron variant is not as bad as some of the other. Uh, variants of <laughs> COVID that we have seen. But great being with you and um, um, also appreciated listening to the previous speakers. Uh, 
with the insights from their practices. And um, I'll tell you why. Uh, Germany is sometimes considered something like the motherland of apprenticeship. And, uh, and there are every year about two thirds of all school leavers go into apprenticeship and, and, and the rest goes into um, academic path. So we see that, uh, univers uh, that the apprenticeship is widely accepted and it is the normal rather than going into college as would be the case in India. And, um, and we, we hardly hear industry saying or complaining about the skills gap because what this does is uh, provides the opportunity that the industries, that the companies um, train, take, take the responsibility for the skilling of their staff at their own hand and, uh, and train um, according to their needs. And, and, and one feature I want to emphasize is about uh, about apprenticeship in Germany, it is it is called the dual training because the periods of school and on the job training interchange. So there are blocks of this and blocks of that. It is other than in India where you have the basic training in a school setting or in the ITI first and then go on the on the job training and you're going to have a much better interaction and integration of the theory and of the practice. And this was the concern I heard from Haitian who spoke first. Um, and, uh, and it's good to see, it's good to see uh, that there is also now in India a push for a better integration of classroom learning and on-the-job training. And I think it would be very helpful for the apprentices to understand in the course of their apprenticeship, not only the execution of running the machines and everything, but understanding I'm having a deeper understanding of the work processes um, that they are, would be ultimately responsible for. So, so that's very good. I'm, I'm happy to hear that. Um, we have, um, I've prepared some slides and if you would, uh, Deepmala, put on the first slide. I'll uh, rely on you for, for the clicking. Um, the, uh, the, the topic, uh, the Sector Skill Council gave me was industry benefits and the National Apprenticeship Scheme. Uh, actually, I thought there was another one, Apprenticeship and Effective Pathway to Employers. That may have, that may have changed between now and the, and the last presentation, but the, the other topic was Apprenticeship and Effective Employment Pathway for Employers. And I put a question mark to this and then make it a rhetoric question and which I want to answer in the affirmative, of course. Yes, apprenticeship is an effective um, employment pathway for employers, but also under certain conditions, of course. Um, here we went to partner with uh, Dalberg International Consultants, NSTC and Dalberg, um, um, almost two years ago, because we wanted to get a better understanding how apprenticeship is appreciated and received by industries and what we found was quite encouraging, yet there is room to grow and to increase the acceptance um, and take up of apprenticeship. Two thirds of the companies that were surveyed saw a net positive value in apprenticeship, which means in other words, the benefit of apprenticeship is greater than the cost of it. And 57% of the surveyed enterprises said, this is not only true in the short term or in the midterm, but even in the long term, and at any rate, and across the sectors, the ratios between benefit and cost were such that the benefits exceeded the costs by margins of one to three to 1.9. And here's something that also I heard from the previous speakers, that is that apprentices reach productivity quite soon throughout their apprenticeship. So, um, 60 to 80 percent of apprenticeship reach that productivity halfway through their apprenticeship training. This is confirmed by international experience. So if the apprenticeship lasts anything between six and 36 months, which is what it is under the Apprentices Act in India, um, then, you can, then you can already calculate and foresee how long it would take for an average batch, of course, some faster, some slower, to reach the level of productivity. And that I think is very good. And then finally, there is the absorption rate. 
across sectors, 20 to 50 percent get um, get hired into full term, uh, full time employment. Um, this is actually this may at first um, look seem like a like a low number, but it isn't really because the practice is that more people, young people are taking in for apprenticeship than would be needed in the, in the short to midterm by that particular industry. But then um, a social benefit is created when more young people are trained and at the same time, it affords the opportunity for the um, apprenticing company to pick from the best. And the others surely will have no difficulty with the training that they have received and the qualification that they have gained to find employment in the legal market. And now we may go on to the next slide, where I want to put yes. apprenticeship into the context of recruitment strategies. So the question was, is it an effective pathway? And uh, um, HR professionals would um, agree with me. Uh, there are two major recruitment approaches or strategies. One is from the labor market, the external, higher externally, and the other one is internal recruitment where employees are transferred or promoted into their present positions, but apprenticeship is also part of it. So we'll put it among the internal strategies. Of course, it's also a little bit of hybrid because the apprentices originally come from the outside of the company, but throughout the apprenticeship training, a pool of suitable candidates for permanent employment is created out of which then um, the organization, the employer may pick as many as they need uh, in the midterm. And I'm emphasizing midterm here because apprenticeships can be as long as three years. So they will, apprenticeship will never be an effective strategy for short-term plugging of employment needs, but it is preparing for the employment that is needed maybe in one to three years from now, depending of course on the length of the apprenticeship. So it's suitable for midterm HR planning. And in India, because of the Apprentices Act, which caps the number of apprentices that may come in to an organization at 50% of total employee strength, there's also um, a limit to it in terms of quantity. Benefit is that internal pool of skilled candidates that I have uh, mentioned that can replace um, leaving employees, but it can also be the basis for future expansion. And, uh, and this is what you hear across sectors and from HR people all over is significantly reduces the cost of external recruitment and additional benefit result in high productivity very fast and in high retainment because there are two reasons I think one thing is a company that trains its own staff creates something like a psychological bond between employee and employer that results in high retainment. But also, and I think this was obvious during the pandemic when many of the migrant uh, workers had left their workplaces, the youth for apprenticeship of course is sourced locally. So you have then in the mid to long term workers that come from the region, that come from the environment of the establishment and are also therefore bound um, to be retained. Um, so this is, uh, this is how it is to be seen as an effective recruitment strategy in the internal context. Um, we may take a look at some of the legalities of apprenticeship, which comes on the next slide. India has an Apprentices Act, which came in in 1961. Um, I've done some comparative legal studies on apprenticeship laws, and I must say, in 1961, in fact, India had to, probably the most, one of the earliest, Switzerland, I think, was the only country that came before India, uh, most progressive apprenticeship um, acts in the world. Um, but it was made for it may was made for industrial apprenticeship. It didn't benefit so much the SMEs and the um, MSMEs. Basic legal requirement here is that the number of apprentices that may be engaged um, is attached to the employee's strengths 
of the establishment. So for any establishment that has more than 30 employees, it is actually mandatory to take in apprentices. Whereas for those that have four to 30 employees, it remains optional. And maybe unfortunate for SME, MSMEs, is also not allowed for, um, for establishments that have less than three employees. However, it's mandatory, but we have seen over the years that this is an act that hasn't been really um, enforced. Um, no penalties were imposed and rightly so, I think the government of India put emphasis on incentivizing to take in apprentices rather than uh, making it mandatory. Um, the establishment that takes in apprentices needs to have an apprenticeship contract with the apprentice that details terms and conditions and it needs to be registered to by the apprenticeship advisor, which today is actually very easy because it goes over the Government of India apprenticeship portal. And one third very important legal requirement is the requirement to pay a stipend to um, the apprentice that ranges from 5,000 to 9,000 rupees, depending on previous um, educational achievement. Uh, next slide then. Here's a table uh, of the apprenticeship stipends. And again, you can see, I'm not going to go through every line of it, but school passouts, fifth class to ninth class will have to get a minimum of 5,000 per month. And those apprentices that are in degree apprenticeship programs um, that are already graduates will have to get a minimum of 9,000 per month. And um, this has been, this has been introduced in 2019, and I think it's also a step forward because it's a rationalization um, of apprenticeship stipends. But you keep that for reference. Um, so we're going to send the um, presentation around to the to the participants after after the presentation, and then you can keep that for reference. Um, on the next slide, I. And of course, speaking to an industry audience, I will emphasize the benefits um, for, for, for the industries or for the establishments. The benefits are flexibility, cost advantage, and a management advantage. And the flexibility comes in through optional trades. I'll explain that in a moment. The cost advantage comes in through NAPS, the National Apprenticeship Promotion Scheme. The government of India supports um, taking in apprentices. And the management advantage is also a organizational advantage. Any organization that does not want to get involved too deeply into the, um, with the uh, administrative work of apprenticeship can source this out to a TPA, a specialized um, Organization Services Provider and TPA stands for Third Party Aggregator. But let's look at the um, let's look at the benefits in a bit greater detail. Optional trades on the next slide. Um, I must say, being affiliated with NSTC, optional trades is that part of apprenticeship that I that I represent here together with the sector skill councils, um, because the designated trades fall under the authority of the director general um, of training under MSDE. And designated trades are notified by the government. They have been predominantly in technical and traditional occupations. The courses are designed, the designated courses are designed by specialized institutions to study and they are approved by the National Council for Vocational Education and Training and CBET. For these, NAPS is available. The optional trades, which I represent to you, are those trades which are created by an industry or by a group of industry or by an employer or by an establishment, whichever you want to call it, simply because they find it relevant and they need something specific for their needs. Um, these have been in the service sector mostly, but we now find that optional trades are um, adopted in um, 
by 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 technical sectors, by technical industries, by traditional and manufacturers, and that is greatly um, encouraging. Um, I said they're implemented by us at NSDC. And yes, SNAPS is available for them also, but only under one condition, namely that this course is aligned with the National Skills Qualification Framework. There's a simple reason for it. If it is an industry specific course, who would know the value of it? Who would know the value of the training and the qualification um, on the labor market later on? Uh, so therefore, in order to express um, the level of qualification that have been achieved, we require this alignment with the um, National Skills Qualification Framework. So this is optional trades. It's grown significantly since 2018. We'll look at the numbers later on. Um, we're going to we're going to have something like three plus lack apprentices by the end of this financial year, and this is um, twice as many um, as the designated trades already. On the next scheme uh, slide, we're going to look at NAPS, the National Apprenticeship Promotion Scheme, and um, I'll make you sure it, it does two things. Um, it reimburses up to 25% of, um, of the stipend cost every month, and it is capped at um, 1,500 rupees a month. Basically, it means that the establishment gets 1,500 rupees per month per um, apprenticeship a stipend paid. And there's also a facility for the reimbursement of the cost of basic training. And again, this is also capped at uh, 7,500 rupees may not seem to be a whole lot, but when um, larger numbers of apprentices are taken in, it sums, it sums up. And I must also say that there is an opportunity to combine this with um, CSR, because any expenditure a company has for apprenticeship, which goes above the legally required minimum, which is 2.5% of the workforce, can be counted as a CSR expenditure. Um, the implementation of NAPS is something that goes over our apprenticeship portal and the status of claims of payments made and all these things are very um, transparent and uh, can, be, can be followed online. Next slide is on the third party aggregator the organization that brings in that management advantage or benefit um, I spoke about earlier, specialized companies that do anything um, to support apprenticeship in the life cycle of an apprenticeship from the beginning onwards to mobilize and candidate, um, counsel candidates to um, provide batches of suitable candidates to the establishment to arrange for the basic training to assist the establishment in designing courses under optional trades. They can arrange cooperative training between um, several companies. Um, they manage the contracts, they manage the stipend payments, they do the registration on the portal. And finally, they may also do the reimbursement or the claim for the reimbursement um, on the portal. We have the number is not quite correct, 98. Actually, there's 85 of them uh, that are impaneled um, with MSDE, Ministry of Skills Development and Entrepreneurism. Um, we as NSDC um, guide and handhold organizations that want to become TPAs, but in the end, it is up to the ministry to impanel them. So these are the three advantages taking in TPAs, availing of NAPs, and being able to design very flexibly courses as per industry needs, which um, I believe makes, a, makes apprenticeship under optional trades a very attractive proposition um, to industries and establishments. And you can see that on the next slide already. I've spoken about the growth path that we have taken. And should be coming up now. There we go. 
There we go. Look at the bar chart on the right, where you can see that um, as per the end of last calendar year, we have already reached close to two and a half lakhs of apprentices. We're going to be way above three lakh for the entire financial year. And this is from a very, very low start that we have taken in 2018 and 2019. We are confident we can double um, the engagement of apprenticeship from year to year in the years to come. Actually, Ministry of Skills Development and Entrepreneurism is now extraordinarily ambitious and has pronounced mission 1 million, which means there should be 1 million apprentices um, by the end of um, the year 2022, but this will be spread not only over optional trades, but over all the other apprentices, apprenticeship schemes that we have. Um, let's just take a quick look at the five top sectors. They are retail, automotive, electronics, IT, and BFSI. Rubber, plastic, chemicals is following further down the line and takes the 11th spot. And the top five states are Maharashtra, Gujarat, Tamil Nadu, Karnataka, and Haryana. Haryana coming in, up, coming in and up very quickly from the ninth position in the year before to the fifth position. Um, uh, that, is also, that is also very encouraging. And that these states are the top five states should be no surprise to anyone because these are the states that have an industrial infrastructure. And obviously, apprenticeship works well where there is industry. Where there is no industry, um, you're not going to have a whole lot of apprentices because the apprenticeship scheme in India is one that had been designed and invented for um, industrial apprenticeships. So this is all very encouraging. The future looks bright. We look to the support of um, sectors and to the companies in the sector to drive it forward. In the rubber sector, which we can see on the, or I should say rubber, plastic and chemicals. It's so easy to say just rubber only, but um, of course there are three subsectors. Um, we can see, we can see, have it uh, broken down state-wise. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to break it down as per subsectors and that deep my eyes on the next slide. Yeah, here we can see it. Um, that <laughs> that we have the that we have the um, top six states here, uh, and um, you can you can already see um, where the growth has been extraordinary uh, from twenty twenty one to twenty one twenty two, and uh, and and you can see the Haryana here, which I had mentioned before. Karnataka seems to be a little bit stable. Madhya Pradesh is actually going down. If anyone has any insights why this would be the case, maybe because the factory has closed down or something, would be interesting, would be interesting to know about it. Um, but the total active establishments in the sector are 587. And definitely um, Sector Skill Council and NSDC would like to see this number to grow. We can move on. Here are the four job roles that we have in um, the in the subsector in the plastic sector. Subsector: they are injection molding operator, printing and packaging operator, machine operator assistant, and the machine operator for plastic processing. Is not a whole lot as compared to some of the other sectors and industries that we see there. But that's not bad, that's not bad. One thing that, uh, let's say from a macro perspective, we do not want to see is a proliferation of job roles that are very narrow and very specific and actually limit them the opportunities um, for the apprentices once they have finished their apprenticeship. But on the other hand, there's definitely room to grow here. And uh, um, the, um, the way to go forward is to work together with the, with the Sector Skill Council to create a trade, a job role, um, an occupational standard as per the specific needs of a company. There are three basic scenarios under which this can work. And that's the next slide. 
Um, this can be done cooperatively with the Sector Skill Council. That's the first blob, uh, the upper left blob on the left side. But also establishments can do that by their own. But then they will have to have it reviewed and approved by the Sector Skill Council. And then finally, there is the possibility, which also makes a lot of sense, by combining already existing qualification packs or um, national occupation standards into a new curriculum, which means then you don't have to reinvent the wheel. In any case, um, NSDC qualification and standards team will have to do the final approval for it. And if the NAPS, if the course is under NAPS, then it also has said this before, it has to be pegged to the national skills qualification framework. On the right, there is the option, of course, to have non-NAPS courses, but these are very few. Um, more than 90% of all courses that we have across all sectors are um, actually NAPS courses, which means also that NAPS, the financial incentive program that the government has brought in, is a major driver of the growth of apprenticeship in the country. This brings me now, I hope I haven't gone over time too much, pretty much to the end <laughs> of the presentation. One more slide I want to show to you, and that is NAPS, NATS, and MEAN. Um, National Apprenticeship Promotion Scheme isn't the only one that there is in India. There is another one which is called NATS, the National Apprenticeship Training Scheme and one that is called NIM National Employment Enhancement Mission. They are totally separate all three from another, but, uh, um, but companies of course can pick and choose and find out what is the most suitable for them. Whereas NAPS is universally applicable to any kind of apprentice. NATS National Apprenticeship Training Scheme comes from the Ministry of Education and it is for those um, apprentices who are also students um, who already have a degree, a diploma or a certificate and want to do a phase of apprenticeship training after they have gained, after they have gained their academic degree. So this will help them to make a transition from college into work. And the scheme pays 3000 rupees per students per month, but it is also limited to one year. And finally, there is NIM, um, National Employment Enhancement Mission, but this doesn't benefit um, companies or establishments directly, but it allows for um, so-called mean facilitators um, to aggregate the um, apprentices or the trainees and place them in the companies. And um, this is for two different target groups, namely post-graduation, also a facilitation of the um, college to work transition, but it's also a program that aims at school dropouts. So I believe for the majority of corporates, NAPS and NAPS are the ones that are the most attractive. Unfortunately, they can't be combined. You cannot have a candidate that comes in under NAPS first and then continues after NAPS, but, um, but both are there, both are good, both are easy to apply for and to administer and to, um, the combination <laughs> of which, in addition with the CSR that I've already mentioned, makes apprenticeship an attractive proposition financially. Beyond that, of course, super way to recruit um, and sustain the labor force in the midterm. Um, save on recruitment costs, have a loyal workforce, have a committed workforce, have an experienced workforce. It's all there. And um, I hope I have been able to uh, arouse or pique your interest. Sector Skill Council, NSDC, we're all there um, to, uh, I shouldn't say take you by the hand, but uh, to help you and support you in every step on it. The best thing would be to visit the portal first and please don't hesitate to be in touch with um, Sector Skill Council or NSDC um, to take the first steps. With this, yeah, I, I agree. <laughs> I agree with you. So actually, they need to just approach us, and we are readily available over here also and through NSDC. Also, people are so supportive. They can write us, 
mail us, they can talk to us over the phone. So uh, there is a question from the audience. What are the parameters that we need to look forward in uh, rubber industry? So really didn't get into the context. What are the wider options for apprentices? Integration with rubber industry. So would like to address this. So it is not 100% clear to me also. So I think they are looking forward for uh, the opportunities as an apprentices in the rubber mm -hmm. industry. So by any which means like, I suppose they need to go and apply for opportunities being created by the industries in the same online portal, apprenticeshipindia.gov.in. So uh, all the openings from all the rubber industries and plastic industries opened up for the apprentices are being visible on the online platform apprenticeshipindia.gov.in. You can go apply there, find and grab opportunity for yourself. As uh, per all the industry speakers, you have seen that uh, the apprentices are being trained within the industry. They have been uh, given the assessments at the end of the program. They will also be certified on NSQF level. And of course, they also get an opportunity if they are performing well on the basis of the performances, they also get an opportunity to get permanent position within the industries. So mostly they are saying those who are completing apprentices can get an opportunity to get hired within the company as a permanent. So mm -hmm. the biggest thing that you usually don't even, even after getting, uh, you know, kind of university degrees and other things, uh, you don't really get good opportunity to get hired in the big organization like these. So if you are as a uh, fresher, if you get an opportunity to get trained and being hired in the industry, it's a big asset for you. Can I also try uh, an answer to the question? Yeah, please, sir. Uh, um, pursuant to, to what I have presented, of course, the op options are NAPS and NATS. And if NAPS is chosen, designated trades and optional trades. And if optional trades is chosen, then NAPS and non-NAPS again. So it comes a little bit around in the circle, but um, I think this is the, this are the, um, these are the options in terms of programs and in terms of um, financial support that can be applied for. Right. So, uh, Mr. Bhaskar would like to add something over here. So, um, we have experimented with various uh, models, and uh, we have aligned to some of the uh, some of the designations, designated trades that uh, Mr. Yan showed uh, of machine operator, plastics, and plastics and rubber operator. Um, so, for us, it is um, it, it, it's it's very clear that. Um, while there will be a specific guideline and a curriculum recommended, your training and how you induct these apprentices into your systems and processes is very important. And uh, that I think is the differentiator. Um, industry is hungry for good people. And, um, you know, uh, it, it's about creating the right infrastructure where these people are trained and then retained. Right, so well said. Uh, Hiten sir would like to add your comments to the industries have joined here from across country and uh, certain people who have joined here as an apprentices looking forward to have a tie ups with industries. So sure, from the perspective of the Indian plastic industry, I think uh, uh, this uh, you know this program has a great advantage. Uh, as we expect the industry to grow double digit in the coming decade, uh, there will be many many opportunities. And anybody who is looking for a you know a meaningful and gainful employment, long term employment, should consider this program uh, as an apprentice. Uh, and that would be beneficial for both the candidates as well as for the industry. So I see a great potential. Of course, uh, as uh, earlier speakers said about, you know, there may be uh, some uh, uh, tweaking on the whole model so that, uh, you know, we can retain more of uh, the candidates uh, and make it more interesting. As a matter of fact, I would go a step further. 
sometimes what happens is small and medium enterprises uh, do not have that keen uh, interest because they lack uh, the time and the resources to go through that but uh, if if there are larger industries uh, where uh, you know these candidates are getting trained maybe we can find a channel for those candidates uh, which are in excess uh, to channelize to uh, msme segment that right. would be a good conduit kind of a thing also this this particular question that deepmala put regarding the addition of fmb be structurally solved um, at the apex level at the or the council level some sort of intervention that would go a long way uh, in terms of uh, making this program even more meaningful today we, we are getting good benefit but it is again restricted by people uh, who are not able to continue right so if there can be some structure which can be provided that that would be the icing on the cake <laughs> that's like the feedback yeah. there is good yeah. news there is good news for that because uh, the uh, ministry is now working on a credit scheme where apprenticeship is broken down into credit hours and also the um, uh the curricula will have hours for the respective module that is to be that is to be learned there so um these these credits will then count for admission into higher education we are also pushing very strongly for the so called degree apprenticeship and many universities and colleges are picking up on it um this is this is very good for For, for for junior talent that is going into management careers that they can that they learn the trade as well as go to the university of times you have it a, a technical apprenticeship with a management uh, with a management course in the college or even vice versa um that's a that's a that's a terrific uh, um foundation For, for for a career and uh, so these things are happening we're going to see over the years under the NEP the uh, new education policy a lot of integration between vocational education and higher education under such schemes and then um the negative social prestige that apprenticeship still has i think can be can be tackled because it's no dead end it will leave all the options open for pursuing pursuing um careers and lifelong learnings after the conclusion of apprenticeship if i may just add and i can mm-hmm. only add that um i have a degree under ncvt i was an yes. apprentice one point of time with siemens i mm-hmm. have completed 3 years of apprenticeship training um and then i have come back to my studies gone back to work so i think the stigma attached to apprenticeship is unnecessary and uh, somewhere uh, With a lot of structured intervention this this can really flourish and um, you know i have seen the benefits of it personally and i have i have friends who have been apprentices with me some of them are still continuing in the trades they chose some of them have flourished some of them are in um, in it and in in programming they, some of them are leading businesses so it really uh, it should be considered for credits in higher education and and what you just mentioned yan is mm-hmm. really encouraging for me as an individual I, it really is inspiring me right now yeah yeah good to good to see your shining example <laughs> <laughs> undoubtedly <laughs> yeah so uh, that man as some of some yeah. of his request you know we can uh, uh, we can put it uh, formal uh, recommendation to the government as an association right sir sure sir sure i believe it would be appreciated that would be a win win situation yeah yeah right sir most welcome that's how we are associated here as a panel discussion because with this kind of panel discussion we actually get to have knowledge as well as uh, we can uh, take it to a next level as mr yen has just now to take it to the credit level it will be really beneficial for the youths of course for industries also and with the perspective of that uh, you know uh, iteration rate of course going to be reflected as it is 
because when it becomes a career pace, then obviously the people who are into more serious towards their career would be pursuing the same. So we can expect them to be stable within the organization for long run. So that's great. So this was indeed a great session. All participants got fair idea about the NAPS program and uh, industry benefit and also uh, the uh, knowledge from the industry experts who have given their expert knowledge to all of us. On behalf of team RCP STC, I thank you all to who have joined us for the session today. I have given the links for our social media platform in the chat box, requesting you all to kindly like and share. Those who have missed out the session can also go and check the session on the Facebook Live. And we are looking forward to have more sessions and discussions along with the industries. Thank I you. I raised my hand in the end. I've seen the questions have come in. We'll address yeah. them duly afterwards. Surely, huh? surely. I'm going to make a note of all these questions so that we can address them over the email. Yes. So we can address these questions. I'm just making a note of it. Thank you, Mr. Yan. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bhaskar. It's a pleasure. Much appreciated. Thank you, Mr. All the best to everyone. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you, you so for much. opportunity. Thank you, sir, for joining the session. Have a nice afternoon and evening. Thank you, sir. We'll collaborate again, maybe in the couple of days. We'll plan another session to have one round of discussions by inviting other industry members also. So I'm just making a note of all the questions being raised. We are going to address these questions over the email. <laughs> also, I'm going to share the presentation from NSDC showcasing the NAPS program scheme along with as an attachment. Thank you so much for joining the session. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Goodbye.